Well, there's a fair number of us here gathered. Um, I've, I've been truly impressed with the interest in this whole topic uh, and how many people have decided to join this uh, opportunity to talk a little bit about our transcendentalist heritage. Uh, there have been somewhat over 60 people who have taken part in this, and maybe half of them are with us right now. Let me just see. I'm thinking, do I have to admit anybody else? All right, it's 434. I belong to the doctrine of limited grace, um, which suggests that we wait a few minutes beyond time, and then we get into the whole topic of the day. So thank you for joining me uh, as I talk about the Transcendentalist for this fourth and final time in this particular series. I'm going to now put all of you on mute um, and begin by just doing a brief recap of the last three sessions. I started out by talking about what I suggest is the um, center of transcendentalist practice that we need to pay attention to in the present age if we're going to learn from them. And that is that these people were reflective and they were socially engaged. Their disciplines included keeping personal journals, writing to one another, um, reflecting deeply and developing spiritual friendships that transcended time and space and that it informed their ability to be engaged with the social issues of their time. I then went on to talk about how perhaps the best person in doing spiritual friendship in that era was Margaret Fuller um, and how transformative her influence as a spiritual friend and as a leader of conversation was to uh, the beginnings of the American women's movement. Now, and what, how tragic it was that in uh, the post-Civil War period, uh, people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony kind of wrote her out of the story. She died uh, in 1850. They... Um, had learned from her. They said that she was a source, but frankly, they developed what was called the myth of Seneca Falls, that the whole women's rights movement began with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass and others at, uh, at Seneca Falls in 1848. Not so much. Uh, the deeper roots really do go to Margaret Fuller and the Transcendentalists. And then last week, uh, I talked about the abolitionist movement, and I didn't begin to pretend that the uh, transcendentalists started the anti-slavery movement in America. No, that's not what sparked in my um, subtitle uh, of the book really wants to suggest. But, you know, things can get a little, um, I was a Boy Scout. Uh, things can kind of smolder and the, the flame almost goes out and then you have to start it up again with a fresh spark. And I think they did that in more ways than one and actually brought it to that level that is implied in the title to conflagration. By the 1850s, it was clearly the bold transcendentalists and black abolitionists like Lewis Hayden and Frederick Douglass who saw that there was going to be no resolution short of a second American revolution, a civil war, to end slavery. Now, I could have done more in these previous uh, sessions to talk about how the Transcendentalists sparked other forms of social reform, uh, because that's in my subtitle as well. There are some brief mentions in the book, but I, don't, I decided not to try to package them all. There, there are things like William Ellery Channing inspiring Dorothea Dix to do something about these poor souls who have nothing wrong with them other than maybe some it, 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 the emotional problem, some mental illness, some uh, cognitive deficits, uh, learning deficits. We would all understand these things and try to uh, deal with 
they were all being thrown in jail or being farmed out by by sheriffs to be cared for sometimes in pig pens in rural Massachusetts. Dorothea Dix's uh, memorial to the legislature in Massachusetts starting the mental health movement in America, I think is one of the forgotten uh, influences of this entire era of American Unitarianism in Boston, including Channing as kind of the inspirer of the transcendentalists. I'm not going to claim that Dorothea Dix was much of a transcendentalist. She was not inclined to think about the philosophical issues behind what she was doing. She was just doing. But then Cheney inspires somebody like the politician Horace Mann, who's despondent after his first wife's death, to find a new focus for his life, not in running for governor or becoming a senator, but working for free, high quality public education. My God, did that transform America. Was that not uh, uh, timely? The, the great age of immigration was ahead in America. And if we had not had free public schools to begin to assimilate people coming from abroad, we'd have had even more problems than we have today with intercultural or multicultural civilization being established. There are people like Samuel Bridley Howe, who's frankly not one of my favorite people. He's a male chauvinist pig of the first order. But he is a pioneer in education for the blind at the Perkins School in Boston. Uh, when Charles Dickens came to America, the first person he wanted to see was Laura Bridgman, who was uh, the both blind and deaf woman um, that Gridley Howe had, well, I think, frankly, he used her as kind of an experiment. Uh, can we see if she is kept apart from the usual socialization that says that you got to, you know, give your heart to Jesus and confess yourself as a sinner? She'll, she'll find herself to be a good person and make good moral decisions. And then some, while he was away, some uh, nurse in the Perkins School um, gave her the Baptist treatment. And his, his experiment failed. But he was such a reformer that, for example, when he married young Julia Ward of New York, they went off with um, Horace Mann and Mary Peabody Mann on a joint honeymoon. <laughs> you don't see that very often anymore. <laughs> but in the 19th century, uh, I, I find there, there are honeymoons like James Freeman Clark on his honeymoon. He had his mother and his sister came along. Okay, um, they went to Europe. Why? This is a honeymoon? To investigate what's being done at the height of social reform in Europe. And of course, Mary Peabody Mann was the sister of Elizabeth, who, as I pointed out in one of the earlier conversations, is tragically only remembered today for her role in starting early childhood education, kindergarten education in America. She uh, had started out with James Freeman Clark and the Church of the Disciples. And just to give you a couple of, of instances of the way in which a transcendentalist church would do something that other people wouldn't think about, that Church of the Disciples, when they would meet every two weeks for kind of like a prayer meeting, what's bothering you about what's wrong out there in the world? What should we do about it? They come up with their first two major projects, a shelter for women fleeing domestic abuse in 1842. Nobody was doing that. And a retirement home for aging women of color. Let me tell you, nobody was doing that either. They maintained those social projects 
as examples for others. And then, of course, the great social reform project of the Transcendentalist Movement is the U.S. Sanitary Commission during the Civil War. The biggest humanitarian effort ever mounted in American history up to that point, kind of the um, early predecessor of the American Red Cross, later led by Universalist Clara Barton. Now, in the period of the Transcendentalists, uh, which for the, these purposes, let's say, starts with the first meeting of the Transcendentalist Circle in 1836 and ends roughly the year after the Civil War in 1866, those 30 years of change were just huge in America. Uh, I always try to build in some social consciousness, some demographics, some um, economic statistics. So here's Here's one thing. Population during that 30-year period went from 13 million in all of the United States. We're now at 330 million. To 31 million in 1860. Nine more states were added to the Union. Immigration was pouring in, especially from places like Ireland that was going through the potato famine. Industrialization was part and parcel of what they were dealing with, including the development of the big textile mills in, in New England that were deeply tied in with the cotton trade. Railroads, I mean, railroads start running past Thoreau's cabin at Walden Pond. And the growth in material prosperity, which only seemed to deepen the divide between the ultra-rich and those who were caught almost permanently in poverty. Does any of this sound familiar or relevant? One of our hymns that we sang in church here in San Francisco said a few weeks ago, uh, the country was rich in things and poor in soul. Now, I think that the transcendentalists were concerned about the way in which this focus on material prosperity and material thing had left out something that was to use sort of classic um, bifurcating language, not material but spiritual. And I'll talk about the limitations of that bifurcation in a moment. I think of this quotation from Henry David Thoreau. Men everywhere, no, I'm sorry, men nowhere, east or west, yet live, men nowhere, east or west, yet live a natural life, round which the vine clings, in which the elm willingly shadows. Man would desecrate it by his touch, and so the beauty of the world remains veiled to him. He needs not only to be spiritualized, but naturalized on the soil of the earth. This is from the introduction to a wonderful book by my friend David Robinson, with whom I went to seminary. Um, David just retired as the uh, distinguished Oregon professor of literature at Oregon State. Um, na natural life, Thoreau's worldly transcendentalism. Now, our theme today is going to be primarily about the transcendentalist impact on um, the understanding of nature in its relation to humanity. There acceptance of evolution and their contributions to the first seedlings, let's say, of American environmentalism. Now, I just recounted that this was an era when the natural world here in North America was being desecrated right and left. There are brief mentions of, of things like what um, Frederick Henry Hedge, for whom the first transcendentalist circle was named, 
found when he went to Maine in Bangor in the 1830s, the place was being clear cut. The forests were being sacrificed right, at left, and center. The um, relationship to the natural world was one of what can we get out of it? How can we exploit the natural world? How can we uh, mine coal, lead, gold once we get to California, use the forests? No sense of limitation. This was certainly the truth, even when Emerson wrote his first book that really kicks off the whole transcendentalist movement. And that, of course, is his book called Nature, published in September of 1836, just a day after the first meeting of the transcendentalist circle. So obviously it has some background. And let me just recap a bit of that that's also encompassed in the book. I think one of the things that was so hard for people in the 19th century with, as I pointed out earlier, if, if, if you think our present pandemic is bad, infectious disease was rampant and there wasn't a person who didn't experience premature death in their family. Emerson had lost his father when he was a boy of nine. Robert Richardson opens his uh, wonderful biography of Emerson, Emerson the Mind on Fire, with this poignant scene of Emerson and his brother William walking through the streets of Boston behind their father's casket on the way to the cemetery. The family was left poor enough that the, those two boys had to share one winter coat to go to Boston Latin School. Mrs. Emerson was given the great opportunity of opening a boarding house as a way of making a living. The church gave her free use of the parsonage for six weeks. How generous. And $100 for each of the male children for their education. The oldest Emerson son Ralph Waldo's older brother William was the one who was designated to father to follow his father and grandfather into the ministry. He went to Germany and came back saying, I've learned too much to be able to preach the Bible. Why? Because the Germans were ahead of anybody else in realizing that <laughs> Biblical interpretation needed to be adapted to some sense of natural limitation. Is the parting of the Red Sea, really? Um, all of those miracles of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they had to reinterpret them as somehow symbolic uh, representations of something that had actually happened inside human beings. There was a spiritual reality, but not a physical one. Ultimately, Emerson is the guy who says there's only one miracle. Life. Or I can raise my hand. He put it another time. The resurrection, the key miracle of the Christian faith, was more spiritual. That is... Jesus was re-experienced by the people who had loved him as still being, in some sense, spiritually present with them. That the body of Christ was the church. That it wasn't a physical resurrection. He was influenced by people like the Quakers and his brother William, who could come back from Germany with the same idea. Jesus didn't mean for us to eat bread and wine as a perpetual memorial to him. He wanted us to find a way of embodying the spirit that was in him. So the circumstance behind, around Emerson's nature is tied up with death. 
tied up with the death of his first wife, Ellen Tucker, who, um, among other things, left him the means to leave the ministry and not have to do these communion services that he found to be a perpetual memorial. I think he found them to be a, a sort of a mourning ritual. Um, he'd gone to Ellen's tomb and opened it, proved to himself that she was really dead. She was 19 when she died. He, did. he goes to Europe and starts in, of all places, Malta. I went there myself, sort of replicating Emerson's itinerary, where St. Paul washed up on the beach and sort of started conventional Christianity. But he proceeds from there through Naples to Rome and Florence. When he gets to Paris, it's in the Jardin des Plantes, the, uh, the horticultural reserve in Paris, that he has what he later claims is his major insight that leads to his book on nature, that nature hides but also reveals levels of meaning that are beyond the merely material. That every plant, every celestial phenomenon is a sign of something more ideal and profound. He comes back to America, and I think under the influence of some of his early studies of the Greeks, like Plato, uh, some influence of a classmate who had become a follower of Emanuel Swedenborg, the Swedish engineer who thought that, indeed, every reality here on Earth is something that is just a reflection of a higher spiritual reality. He writes nature while sitting in the house where his grandfather had watched the American Revolution break out in the old manse overlooking the, uh, the Old North Bridge in Concord. He's almost done with it in the summer of 1836 when what happened? His younger brother Charles suddenly dies. The whole second part of the book, which was originally to be called Nature and Spirit, he realizes he can't even finish. He doesn't know how to deal with the reality of this spiritual catastrophe in his life, the death now not only of their father, his first wife, but also of his most beloved brother, who was his companion in many things, expected to become maybe a better mind than Ralph Waldo. He finishes it with a couple of short chapters on spirit, not the full second part of the book basically inspired by his neighbor and friend Bronson Alcott, whose um, Orphic sayings later appear in the dial. And I don't go much for these, my friends. Uh, I find them to be sort of uh, early New Age, God only knows what. Um, they seem to me to evade the basic issue between what goes on in us inwardly and our reactions to the natural world by emphasizing that everything is spiritual. I don't think they represent transcendentalism at the core. I think that transcendentalism at the core says that, yeah, nature is real. But there is some level of meaning in the universe that is not uh, totally captured by or can't be summarized in mere material measurement and counting.
I don't think that's a big stretch. There's meaning in the natural world. Secondly, all of these folks were products of an era when they were beginning to recognize that the natural world is not static, it evolves. Uh, this is before Darwin. People like John Lyle, the geologist in Britain, had shown that there were layers of fossils and, you know, what? The world can't be just 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years old. It's got to be eons that these, the, the creation story in Genesis is symbolic, not literal. So if the natural world evolves, our understanding of the natural world and of our relationships with one another in dealing with it should also evolve. And then I would say lastly, although Emerson doesn't play this all out in nature itself, he's, he, his insight is that there is one is much more likely to have one's soul open to transcendent meaning, to the over-soul, as it were, in communion with nature or in true conversation and spiritual friendship with intimates than one is in the superficialities of commercial and conventional society. I have a, acquired a new friend in the course of, of my work on this book, a fellow named Tyler Green, who's got a book coming out from Princeton University Press that's going to argue that a lot of what Emerson says in nature was is influenced not just by direct communication with the natural world, although he says that it started in the Jardin de Plantes, but it was mediated by his own reading and his own experiences of art that were beginning to treat the natural world not as um, merely a stage setting, but as harboring meanings beyond the landscape itself, sublime, the romantic notion. And in turn, that Emerson went on, and I would say this is exactly right, to influence culture, art and literature, and some scientists far more than people recognize. Now, of course, the major figure in transcendentalism in dealing with the natural world is his uh, protege and disciple, Henry David Thoreau, younger, and is a much more acute um, daily observer of the natural world than Emerson was himself, um, including, I, I, I think I make brief reference of the, to this, I, recent scholars of Thoreau have found that he did remarkable observations on some of the early signs of global warming and climate change. Measuring when the plants came to fruition, uh, emerged from the, the soil, what were the temperatures. He, he, he was an co interesting combination of transcendentalists and very careful observational scientists. He too, I think, was motivated in part by his own experiences of death. Because in the human experience of the natural world, what is more difficult for us than the reality that we are going to lose people whom we love and that our own lives are indeed going to end. There is a quotation that I often used at memorial services as long ago, I remember, as when I was minister in Knoxville. Um, and it comes from a letter that Thoreau wrote in 1842 in March. And here's the passage. How plain that death is only the phenomenon of the individual or class. Nature does not recognize it. She finds her own again under new forms without loss. Yet death is beautiful when seen to be a law and not an accident. <laughs>
It is as common as life. Men and women die in Tartary, Ethiopia, in England, in Wisconsin. And after all, what portion of this so serene and living nature can be said to be alive? Do this year's grasses and foliage outnumber all the past? Every blade in the field, every leaf in the forest lays down its life and its season as beautifully as it was taken up. It is the pastime of the full quarter of the year. Dead trees, sear leaves, dried grass and herbs, are not these a good part of our life? And what is that pride of our autumnal scenery but the hectic flush, the sallow and cadaverous countenance of vegetation in its painted throes with the November air for canvas? When we look over the fields, we are not saddened because the particular flower or grasses will wither. For the law of death is the law of new life. Will not the land be in good heart because the crops die down from year to year? The herbage cheerfully consents to bloom and wither and give place to a new. So it is with the human plant. We are partial and selfish when we lament the death of an individual, unless our plaint be a pine to the departed soul and the sigh as the wind sighs over the fields, which no shrub interprets into its private grief. Thoreau wrote that two months after his beloved brother John died of lockjaw. He never published it. It's in a letter. It is indicative of how some of the best writing of Emerson, Fuller, Thoreau, Alcott, was never published but remained in their journals. If there is one literary flaw that I would accuse all of them of, it was going back over their original insights and mining them for little gems that could be set in some kind of a beaded necklace and sold to the public. Emerson is particularly guilty of this. What makes all of these reader, these writers of that era hard to read is not that they were so different from us. I mean, that passage I just read from Thoreau, it touches me. But when they mined their own writing for aphorisms and for little gems, and in Margaret Fuller's case, for proof that she was as smart and as well educated as the boys and could, you know, cite Latin and Greek, <clears throat> it gets worse. Often, the journal, the letter, is more poignant and more readable. People don't realize that Thoreau was, um, when he went to Walden and built his little cabin there, at work on taking his own journals and developing from them a book that he published under the title A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, a week that he had spent with his brother John. I have already read to you that brief passage about how life needs to be not spiritualized but naturalized. I think that's a good insight. And whether it was in the original journal or in the final published volume, I don't know. All I know is that the book didn't sell. Not at all. Thoreau had to essentially self-publish, get a printer to do a thousand copies of it. And a few years later, the publisher sent back to him the original uh, plates, printing plates and the unsold copies, and at which point Thoreau famously wrote, 
I suddenly find myself in possession of a gentleman's library of some 900 volumes, nearly 700 of which I wrote myself. Those were the unsold copies. I also want to point out that even though he was among the transcendentalists perhaps the most devoted to observation of the natural world, he was not nearly as de detached from society as he is often portrayed. I didn't realize until I researched this book that he often led the committee that invited speakers in for the Concord Lyceum, as well as lecturing there if somebody didn't show up. And it's not just speeches like um, what later gets published as a, a walking that were originally given as lectures to the, Con the Concord Lyceum, or the one that later gets called civil disobedience. There's this wonderful scene of Henry David Thoreau, of all people, leading the children's Christmas party in Concord that was organized to provide every child, however poor, with a Christmas gift, and him sitting under the tree set up in the town hall, handing out the gifts. Meanwhile, his family is harboring fugitive slaves, but he is more and more during this period, especially in the 1850s, um, he, he's devoted to the natural world. And uh, if you've never dipped into any of his nature writing, um, his late writings are, are masterful in close observation, uh, whether it's birds, or the, the timing of the fruits are, uh, coming along. The last thing I'm going to say about him has to do with his role in um, the American acceptance of Darwin's approach to evolution. Now, there's this uh, book out that, <laughs> to me, illustrates how authors don't get to pick their own titles. It's called The Book That Changed America We're not getting any by, um, by Randall Fuller, who I discovered is a professor at the University of Tulsa, which may explain a great many things about why he's interested in the American reception of uh, evolution. Darwin's book, um, The Origin of the Species on the Basis of Natural Selection, comes out in late 1859, right before the Civil War. And one of the first copies, or several copies, seems to have been sent to the Harvard botanist, uh, Louis Agassiz, who was born in Switzerland. Well, his brother-in-law was a New York reformer who worked with a uh, street kid named uh, Charles Brace. And in this book by Randall Fuller, the book that changed America, bad title, good book, um, there's a dinner party in Concord held by Franklin Sanborn, the young schoolmaster and founder of the Concord Academy, who had been one of the secret six backing up um, John Brown. Uh, and who else are the guests? Brace is there to be a speaker at the Concord Lyceum. And one of them is Henry David Thoreau, because he's a leader in the Lyceum. And another is Bronson Ellicott. And it is one of the first public discussions of Darwin's semi-public discussions, recorded discussions, because they all went home and wrote in their journals. Darwin's notion that evolution proceeds by natural selection. All four of them were tremendously excited that what Darwin had shown scientifically was that the human species had one common ancestor. Yes. That there were no special uh, separate creations of different races, which was the argument of a good many uh, defenders of slavery and racism in the period. Of the four, However, it's clear that Thoreau was the one who was most positive for its scientific implications. 
the last two years of his life are devoted to his making observations in the woods to try to add to Darwin's basic thesis. The tragedy, of course, is that he dies, like his brother, prematurely. Probably with a combination of tuberculosis and some other infection in 1862. Now, I would say that the influence, however, the transcendentalist hardly ends there when it comes to American environmentalism. And the key figure is a young man raised in Scottish Calvinism, which is always a good basis for becoming interested in Unitarianism. A young man named John Muir, who in 1863 moves from his family's farm in Wisconsin to the University of Wisconsin in Madison and develops a close friendship You'll love this, Jeff, with a chemistry professor and his wife, Ezra and Jean Carr, both of whom are devout Unitarians and who introduce John Muir to the works of Emerson and Thoreau. Muir proclaims himself very quickly a devout and thorough Emersonian. He doesn't have access to a lot of Thoreau's close observations of nature because they weren't published. But he gets the hint from his uh, exposure to this scientist who understands how the transcendentalists were focused on the deeply meaningful experiences of life, the meaning of life itself being embodied in the natural world and needing to be uh, discovered spiritually there. Uh, toward the end of my book, there's this wonderful scene in 1871, when Ralph Waldo Emerson, now beginning to lose it, frankly, um, comes to California. He gives uh, four lectures at the church in San Francisco. Um, the only thing that's remembered by the uh, People who heard him was that he knocked the flowers on the pulpit over. Um, his somewhat abstracted essays went right over their head. The minister, Horatio Stebbin, says, you know, he could just see people glazing over. But where Emerson could come down to earth again, was in a human encounter with somebody that he thought was doing something that was real and important and connected to the interpretation of the natural world. His wealthy son-in-law and his son accompany him up to Yosemite and he spends an entire day with John Muir. At the end of it, he wants to stay, Muir wants him to camp out for a while and learn more about differentiating one species of pine from another and the difference between sequoias and redwoods and how the geology of, of Yosemite may have come about and the whole evolutionary evidence that it embodies. Sun and, the son won't put up with it. He's a doctor. He knows that his father's frail and makes him ride back over the hill. Emerson holds back and waves his benediction at John Muir, saying, you know, I think that man may even be a better naturalist than Thoreau was. It's not a big leap then to John Muir in his maturity taking a motto from Henry David Thoreau, in wildness is the preservation of the world, and making it the motto of the Sierra Club. Making it the motto of the entire effort to set aside at least some of the North American continent 
as a reminder of what I would call the transcendence of nature. Because what Muir did not quite capture from Thoreau, but that my friend Malcolm Gladwell has shown in his close study of Thoreau's original journal, is that for Thoreau, the phrase wildness was actually a theological term. It stood for that aspect of the natural order that is continually created if it is not taken for granted and paved over and ignored it's that part that we should be in awe of, the wild. It goes right back to a deep New England sensibility about the transcendent within the natural world. I would say that today there is no more important heritage that we can grasp from our transcendentalist her uh, forebears than that one. Climate change shows it to us. We should stand in awe of that which is wild and creative in the natural world. It is the part that we human beings are not to tamper with or ignore. It transcends us. We are products of it. Evolution shows that. But if we begin to take it for granted and just exploit its parts and pieces as though it were nothing but an assembly of uh, trees to be cut, mines to be drilled, lands to be eroded and exploited, then we are oceans to be taken for granted and dump plastics in, then we are just ignorant and failing to understand that there is a sacred reality embodied in the natural world. that we are beholden to permanently. And with that, let me stop and unmute you all so that you can speak. So how do I do that? Way down at the bottom, I guess. Let's see. All right, what I'm doing is allowing all of you to unmute yourselves, okay? So, um, I, Chris, are you on? All right, um, I, I see Jeff uh, has spoken. I spoke to all of you particularly. Jeff, I'm not hearing you well. Okay, I'll come closer to the mic. Uh so, John, what you just said reminds me of a book, which is one of my favorites, which is uh, Reverence by Paul Woodruff at the University. Yes. In the sense of awe, part of reverence, and humility to feel shame and so forth, is Woodruff, it's an antidote to hubris. Yes. And I think the transcendentalists so what you say had that notion. I, I, I commend people to think about this. I'm a great fan of virtue ethics, and I think reverence is I mean, How can you not feel in awe of nature if you're a scientist? Yeah, right. And I, and I, I think it's important to recognize that the, although they were rebelling against it, these men and women had all studied Latin and Greek. So the whole idea of humility and hubris was built into, and even the idea of uh, Amicizio, uh, Cicero's great essay on friendship, 
These classical references are there, but I thought you were going to cite another book that's a favorite of mine, and that's um, Ursula Goodenough, um, who you know is a, herself a scientist and not a theist, but somebody who's what, what's the title of her book? Sac sacred Nature or Sacred Reality? She sees. Although she and Paul wrote, wrote an article together, which I have cited. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this is where humanists and uh, and scientists, are, I think, are beginning to meet around some of the vital insights that our transcendentalist forebearers were trying to lift up. John McNair is, says, "I, the host." What do I need to do? Uh, what I tried unmuting it said uh, the host is not allowing me to unmute, so you may still have some buttons to push. Uh, I, well, I pushed the button that says allow everybody to unmute themselves. Chris, can you try that? Chris was talking and uh, we couldn't hear him. I... It worked for me. Try again, Chris. Working now. There it is. Um, oh, there we go. Chris, can we... Yes. You know, brother, I owe this whole opportunity to have this dialogue to your suggestion. So um, what have you to say? Well, I didn't even plan it, but I'm wearing my Thoreau t-shirt uh, uh, today, <laughs> which I, I picked up. Uh, we take our high school on a uh, Boston Heritage trip, which John uh, got started many years ago. And uh, one of our, uh, uh, so it really has been a, a spiritual pilgrimage for our youth to go out to Concord and go to Emerson's house and go to Walden Pond. And I, I told them about, you know, how they studied the world religions. And then we met a Hindu group that was out there visiting Walden Pond. And it's just been a, you know, it's a really important part of, uh, of the spiritual formation of our, of our youth. So. Well, that gives me occasion, Chris, to tell you a, a funny story from the very first um, Knoxville coming of age trip to Boston. Mm -hmm. 1976. I thought I couldn't let the uh, anniversary of the American Republic uh, go by without trying to show the youth from the church. And by the way, we took the youth from Charlottesville with us. Um, I couldn't, I, I wanted them to understand that the, the broadening of American democracy had been deeply tied up with Unitarian history. Uh, so we uh, allowed and democratically, they used to select a certain number of places that they wanted to see. My recollection is that some of the girls in the group particularly wanted to go to Concord to see the house where Louisa May Alcott wrote Little Women. Yeah. And there was at least one guy, Joe and Mary, do you have a son that was in that group? Okay, unmute yourselves. Okay. No, John. Mark, yeah, that would be later. Then later, okay. There, there was a, a, a young man in that group whose name was close to yours somehow, in my vague recollection. He had a very broad East Tennessee accent. And he and the other guys wanted to go see Old Ironsides. The ship, the Constitution, in East Boston. And that day we went to UUA headquarters, we went to King's Chapel, we went to First Church in Boston, we went to the Arlington Street Church, I showed them all of the shrines of the Transcendentalist Movement downtown, and then we got to uh, Old Ironsides at 4.30 in the afternoon, only to discover that the National Monument there had closed at 4. <laughs> And from the back of the bus, this fellow, I've never forgotten this, pipes up and in his wonderful East Tennessee accent says, Oh, shit. <laughs> That's just right. I know why it, Joe yeah. came to mind now. <laughs> <laughs> That's just like this trip. Church, 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 all day long, and then we miss the boat. 
<laughs> Sound like you'd learned a lot in Sunday school. I think so. <laughs> we, we, we teach by uh, you know the experiential method, uh, but the, the, the teacher learns in that as well. That I thought that was just hilarious. And when the kids came back and gave a service that reported on the whole experience to the congregation, although I think we cleaned up the language just a little, um, we we reported on that particular moment. John, when you yeah. when you talk, John, when you talk about the uh, Maine being denuded, the forest, mm -hmm. it's a sadder story than you realize. What they had to have for the big ships is a, a tree that came down and the root turned to the right so they could attach the bottom, the back of the ship to the front. So they dug these trees up. So everyone yeah. that didn't have the right root, they just threw it aside and dug up another one. They like, took something like 16 or 20 of these trees per ship. And that's how they denuded Maine, digging them up. Yeah. It's a sadder story than we thought. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the fellow for whom Emerson named the Transcendental Circle, Frederick Henry Hedge, in uh, 1837 goes up to uh, Bangor, Maine, which is a boom town. But what was going on up there was one of these, um, you know, like the gold rush out here, uh, temporary exploitations of the natural world that left behind a horrendous um, deprivation afterwards, uh, ecological disaster. Uh, once all of the forests of Maine were, were stripped away, and of course, Thoreau goes up there and visits Mount Katahdin, um, writes about it. The rest of the history of Maine is of depopulation. Right. Of uh, people moving out. Um, and I remember when I was coming out of semin the seminary in the 19 early 1970s, one of the reasons I ended up in Knoxville, I think, was I told the settlement officer at the time, I did not want to go to Maine. <laughs> Well, as punishment, he sent you to Knoxville. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, the, the reason I ended up in Knoxville was very simple. It was the largest church that offered me a call. <laughs> and I had so little confidence in my own abilities that I thought that there was a chance that it might even survive my worst mistake. <laughs> Right. Well, it worked out all right then. <laughs> uh, you know, so there's a, a requirement, uh, I think, of ministers to also discern uh, where. But I, you know, I am eternally grateful for the start in ministry that I got at the church in Knoxville because. The congregation, from the time I arrived there, knew what its mission was. Still and does. So the, the, and it, it's very closely tied to some of the themes in this book. Mm -hmm. One of the things I started to look into was this year's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Yeah. How often did Earth Day get spread beyond the universities? Because it started as kind of a teach-in in university classrooms in 1970 in Madison, Wisconsin, with Gaylord Nelson, the senator and the university there, I think with some John Muir memory behind it. But I remember when I arrived in Knoxville in 1973, TVUC, as it then was, and the local Sierra Club were already the key sponsors of the community celebration of Earth Day. And one of our major projects was we were setting up the first place where you could bring recycling in Knoxville to the parking lot yeah. at TVUC. 
and we were lobbying for a container deposit bill at the state level so that bo bottles and cans would be redeemable for you know, a nickel or whatever. That was one of those moments where my early political naivete got uh, uh, tossed into the basket because I then discovered that the Speaker of the Tennessee House of Representatives was also the biggest beer distributor in the state. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Ned Ray, Ned Ray right? <laughs> And so that the idea of putting deposits on beer bottles was going absolutely nowhere <laughs> in the Tennessee legislature. But I still remember uh, we had a team from the church and from the Sierra Club that adopted a whole stretch of highway and going up and down and being filmed for the evening news that we were concerned about what was being done to take the, our environment for granted. And this was just one symbol of it. Uh, the superintendent of Great Smoky Mountains National Park was in the congregation during my time there. Hmm. Will Skelton. I don't know if Will is still alive. He's still there. He's still He's still around. Around. Yeah. Give him my greeting. Yeah. Will was the president of the Sierra Club. He was also at that time uh, Howard Baker's law partner. Yeah. And a very influential figure. And, you know, this building of spiritual friendships, coalitions, transcending differences in various forms of opinion to, uh, to actually change the world. And this goes back to my first learning from the transcendentalists as a matter of spiritual discipline. They were reflective enough to try to build friendships that transcended differences in social location, political opinion, philosophy, religion. I had to do that in Knoxville. You know, my closest allies in keeping a Billy Graham curriculum out of the public schools. Two Baptist ministers. Mm -hmm. Separation of church and state. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And a rabbi. <laughs> no surprise there. Yeah. Yeah. People don't know about but we were, you know, if it had been just the Unitarians and the Jews, we'd have gotten nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> It reminds me, Chris, of you know what I, what I had to say when I came back for the rededication of the building after the shooting. You know that that we've been facing into some really bad stuff for a long time. Yeah. And um, you know, the women's issues. Good Lord, the the whole women's movement in Knoxville in the 1970s was in the Unitarian Church. Yeah. And that's what the shooter remembers. Yeah. When, we, when you came back for the dedication after the shooting in the coffee hour, you may not remember this, but you told the story about when the church was hosting the Metropolitan Community Church. Yep. Uh, that somebody came and uh, shot out the window. And, the whole uh, pickup truck full of good old boys with a shotgun. Yeah. Well, you said that story, and as you walked off, my, my treasurer was next to me, and he says, do not tell that story to our insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I, I think you know, Chris. Yeah. But we made a leadership decision, the board and I. Yeah. Not to even tell the police. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we knew that if we called attention to the fact that we were hosting a GLBT community group, the police were not our allies. Yeah. And that's that actually changed in our, our time when we hosted the uh, 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 Spectrum Coffee House for GLBT kids. The police would actually come through our parking lot to make sure we were safe. You know, they, they've incorporated diversity as part of the mission in the city. The county is very different, uh, yeah. but in the, in the Knoxville city. Uh, so there has been a lot of change and a lot that's still the same. So. Yeah. 
So I think one of the reasons we study history is to get a perspective on how much has changed and how much we still are wrestling with. Yeah. Bill, I just saw you raise your hand. Hello. Yeah, I did. I wanted, I was going to mention at the end of last week, we were running out of time, and I wanted to mention it tonight, uh, Chris, and you brought up the MCC. Um, I uh, used to be an MCC minister, John knows, years yes. ago. And, um, Lean in the microphone a little bit, Bill. Bill is just a fabulous uh, member of the San Francisco congregation. He's also been the housing director for um, San Mateo County for uh, many years and uh, at my behest became the first chair of our social justice council when we re re realized our, our uh, social justice work. But, but Bill was an MCC minister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you hear it, John? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to mention uh, last week, I think it was partly uh, folks were wondering um, yeah, about, it was connected with emancipation, but then we were talking about how does the church witness and uh, being in the streets and so on and not in the streets. And, you know, I wanted to mention that sometimes it's not in the street. It was the uh, the way you, you had ministered to so many uh, LGBT folks was the use of their facilities. And the first MCC I pastored uh, met in the uh, uh, Unitarian Universalist Church in Redwood City, California, and they, for minimal rent, probably zero practically, let us uh, meet there every week and gave us an office. And that was true around the country. Uh, it, you know, sometimes we met in bars or, or old movie theaters, but uh, if not, if we knew to go to the local uh, Unitarian Universalist Church and they'd let us meet there. And that, it touched um, tens of thousands of people. Um, we, do, we don't even know how. It's just amazing. That's another kind of uh, witness or outreach or however you would put it, just uh, social action, really. Uh, yes. So I just wanted to mention that, and I'm very grateful. You remind me, Bill, thank you, that... Um, in the year 2000, when the Millennium March for Equality was held in Washington, D.C., there were only two clergy who addressed the throng out there on the Washington Mall, Troy Perry, the founder of the MCC, and yours truly. Mm -hmm. And I was so struck by being the only non-gay clergy person on that uh, platform I wasn't given a great many minutes, I think 10 or 8 or something like that. But the first thing I did, and there were, were somewhere between a quarter and a half a million people on the mall, is I asked everybody who had ever been in a Unitarian Universalist meeting house for an MCC worship service or an ACLU meeting or any other gathering to try to change the world in the direction of justice, please stand up and wave at me. 80% of the people on the mall did that. Wow. Yeah. 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 The way in which our congregations have functioned through the years as sanctuaries of conscience. Again, going back to the basic understanding of the call of conscience that our transcendentalist forebearers had. You're a moral agent, as am I. I have to respect your moral and spiritual capacity as a transcendent imperative across differences. Because unless I help you become the best person that you were called to be, I am not fulfilling my role in the wider human family either. That is the heritage of the transcendentalists. It's the most important part of their message. It's what lies behind their advocacy for everything from free to high quality public education to decent mental health care to women's rights to LGBT rights. Mind you, in the 19th century, they were not dealing with issues of sexual orientation. Oh. 
And actually, some of the worst um, misinterpretations of this era, I find, are trying to project uh, the sexual orientation issues back into uh, the 19th century. Although I think I did point out that um, people like Margaret Fuller almost anticipated the idea that um, there is a male and female component to every human being. And that um, gender identity issues, which we're only beginning to come to terms with, the T and LGBT, she actually spoke about and wrote about in the 19th century. Uh, by the way, during the General Assembly, I will be uh, one of the six featured speakers. Uh, I just taped the piece that will be on uh, this past week. Uh, I'm not alone because you can't speak about spiritual friendship transcending differences by yourself. I did it with my dear friend, Phyllis Cole, who is a great scholar of Margaret Fuller. So we dialogued about some of these uh, issues of spiritual friendship transcending difference and making an impact historically. And then there are two other people who come on. One is Rochelle Fortier Nwadibia from our congregation, Bill. Um, African Americans, Caribbean American more accurately, um, human rights attorney, one time human rights commissioner for the state of Missouri, talking about what it was in her upbringing uh, in a diverse setting that actually inspired her to do the kind of human rights work that she's done. And then lastly, uh, Lisa Garcia Sampson, who uh, is the new director of our UU Justice Ministry in North Carolina, an absolutely critical place to deal with things like voter suppression. And uh, she's married to a, a person who identifies as non-gender binary and is Hispanic and Roman Catholic. <laughs> so, you know, spiritual relationships that transcend difference, yeah. she knows how to witness to. And that's still one of the key things that whenever I talk about this book, I want people to take away as its relevance today, that um, our forebearers, actually saw doing that as a, uh, a spiritual discipline. And uh, it's almost like I'm saying, who the heck are we to sort of regress into silos of sameness? Yeah. There is a temptation on the part of every human being to do that. Mm -hmm. We feel affirmed by looking in the mirror in somebody else and saying, well, that person's like me. And we do it on the basis of somewhat superficial stuff. Race, education, social class. We don't do it enough transcending those categories and building friendships that will actually expand our understanding of what it means to be human and to be human in this time and to be human facing some real moral imperatives that will affect the whole human family. I think that the transcendentalists show us a great deal on not only how to re-spark efforts for racial justice and gender justice and social reform, but also how to deal with the fact that the planet's on fire. And if this little book, Conflagration, has anything to say, it's about some spiritual methodologies for trying to uh, create the fire breaks that will help us make a decent life more possible for more generations to come. <laughs>
Right. So with that, I think I have just about exhausted my rhetoric this evening. Any one or two last... Uh, oh, Gordon, you're always welcome. <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm probably always sounding off. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, as you have talked tonight about Henry David Thoreau, uh, I think back to a, a UU Heritage trip that I led some years ago. I think the only person on this conversation who was part of that is, is Chloe. Oh. And, uh, I heartily endorse doing this with adults. They have longer attention spans and different levels of different hormonal uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> We had fun. Lack of hormonal. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, several things about us Concord were uh, stu stuck out for me. Uh, I arranged with a friend from college who's a member of the First Parish of Concord to uh, pull us around, and he corrected my pronunciation. He said that uh, there the emphasis is on the first syllable. He is thorough. Uh, yeah. Right. Whatever he is, in any place else. Uh, but uh, you know, we went to Walden Pond. I think more of us were struck by the Orchard House, the Olcott yeah. residence. That was quite fascinating. And since that time, um, for the ministerial study group, uh, I did a piece uh, using Henry mm -hmm. and. Imagining Henry coming back to our world today for a brief visit and uh, commenting in his definite way, way. Yeah. about us. It, it was fairly pungent. We did not come off too well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're exactly right, Gordon. He would be very concerned about how unnatural yeah. life has become. <laughs> and our very dependence on this new technology to try to have a conversation, oh. I'm, I'm sure, would just uh, befuddle and appall him. And yet, of course, we might have to dialogue a little bit about the necessity of evolution. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and adaptation to whatever the social and environmental situation may be. And as much as I um, think there's something lost, there's also something gained. Yeah. I'm, I'm, go I'm going to get back to Henry later this year. Uh, I'm offering a, a course calling History 7, looking at the seven principles and then finding a historical personage or event to uh, illuminate how well or poorly we've done with said principle. And I'm thinking that uh, for the interdependent web, we need to look at both Henry and Tim Berners-Lee. Uh -huh. Because, yeah, the, the, the web keeps shifting, but it's very real. And I think, I think Henry was very, very aware of that. It just comes through so clearly in his writing. Uh, as we wind up, I'm going to put in a plug for a book I didn't write, but that I am uh, currently just enthralled with. Uh, and that's by a, a woman here in San Francisco who I think is a transcendentalist in all but name. Um, one of our leading uh, public intellectuals, uh, Rachel Solnit. Rebecca, is it, or is it Rebecca Solnit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rebecca. Um, really? Her book, Wanderlust, A History of Walking is just a magnificent uh, tour through uh, the way in which what I'm now doing to cope with this uh, self-isolation, uh, sheltering in place, going on long walks every day, 
uh, has a history. Some of the best walking, though, I think, is not solitary. It's walking together, to use a metaphor that um, has often been associated with forming covenantal community. It's walking and talking together. We only get a limited amount of time on this planet together. Our souls, I think, are enriched tremendously by the capacity to walk with others during the time that we have and to kind of grow a soul along the way. Uh, there is a profound sense in the transcendentalists that the best way to grow your own soul, to have any glimmer of what the oversoul might be asking of you, is in walking together with others in conversation and study. Emerson spent hours in his study every morning, thorough, meditated while he was walking through the natural world and came back to write. And they talked about new books, about what was happening in the world that might have a claim on their conscience, what forms of civil disobedience might be demanded of them, how to respond to political leaders who were not only ineffectual, but discredited. And I've, I've sometimes said when commenting on contemporary politics, uh, James Buchanan historically should be uh, very grateful. We used to think he was the worst president in American history just because he led to the Civil War. He's been outdone. <laughs> More than once. Huh? <laughs> One of the things I want to say about Thoreau that is that we talk about him as being a thinker and an and a, and a observer. He was also a very practical guy. Yeah. For solutions to problems. And it's not, it's not well known that he made the first high quality pencil in America. Yeah. Uh, so he, he was a surveyor. He was a bit of an engineer. So he was not only a person who thought and dreamed, but he was also a person who looked for practical solutions. And, and you know, as a scientist, I would have to say, you know, in many of these problems, you need both. There's a spiritual thing to it, but you also got to dig in and find a, a yeah. vaccine. You have to, you know, Thoreau couldn't have written his journals on the road if he didn't have a good pencil. <laughs> <laughs> it was a business he inherited from his father, and I think for that very reason, uh, didn't want to stick with it. He also didn't stick with being a schoolmaster, because the, the school committee in Concord got after him for his refusal to use the rod. <laughs> he inherited the business from his father, but he's the one who perfected the process. Yeah, indeed, you're absolutely right. So, Jeff, I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about is, had you ever heard of chemistry professor Ezra Carr? Ezra what? Ezra Carr. No, I, I, I will look him up. Look him up, because he was the major, in, he and his wife Jean were the major influence on John Muir. And I don't know very much about him either. Uh, there's lots of letters between uh, John Muir and Jean Carr that are cited in uh, histories of the environmental movement, however. Okay. And with all of this, friends, I am going to now say good night and go uh, cook some supper for Gwen and myself. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for it's all of you to join me in these conversations, and I hope they've been of some value to you.